Hi everybody, I am Michelle King, the author of the book, The Fix, Overcome the Invisible Barriers That Hold Women Back at Work. I'm really excited to share with you uh, my book. I was meant to be speaking at South by Southwest and um, sharing more on my book there, but unfortunately, because of coronavirus, that's not happening. So what I do is I, I thought I would give all of you a bit of a taste of what my book's about and share a bit of the talk that I was going to give at South by, um, so you can hear from me. So. A bit about how my journey started in writing this book. I was um, about four years ago now, I was researching what women needed to do to advance at work. Um, what was wrong with women? You know, I very much came from sort of the lean in school of thought, right? With this idea that women need to somehow do more or be more to advance at work. So as a researcher, I thought, you know, I can find this answer and then I can share it with women. Um, and, you know, I can share it with myself, right? I can learn from understanding what it is that I need to do to advance at work. So I spent a lot of time reading all the journal articles that were out there, really trying to understand it. And very quickly into my research, I realized it's not women that need to be fixed, it's workplaces. And the reason I say that is, you know, a lot of the research I was coming across was showing just how capable women are. I mean, men and women in some studies rated women as higher in terms of their networking ability than men. Um, women are more effective managers, according to men and women. Um, they're more sort of effective leaders in today's workplace, right? They're more transformational on average. So women have a lot of capabilities in terms of their ability to collaborate and be a more democratic leader and, you know, be more inclusive. That is really helpful to workplace. It's a much more effective way of working and leading. So I was seeing these studies and it just didn't make sense with a lot of the messaging that women have been given that, you know, something's wrong with them, that they need to do more, right? And um, so I started looking at workplaces and trying to understand what are some of the challenges or what I call barriers that women face in organizations. And it became very clear to me that workplaces, you know, have been designed by and for predominantly men and not just any men, but what I call the Don Draper 1950s prototype of what success looks like, right? So this is a white, middle-class, heterosexual, able-bodied male. Um, but importantly, it's also somebody who's willing to engage in sort of dominant, assertive, aggressive, competitive, and even exclusionary behaviors to get ahead. Someone who's willing to make work sort of the number one priority, right? And can do that because they're free from sort of dependent care responsibilities. Um, and this image of sort of traditional masculinity, you know, the attributes we associate with men and masculinity is what we associate with leaders and what success looks like in organizations. And this has pretty much been replicated um, in a lot of studies and showing that, you know, organizations have this inbuilt prototype. And prototypes matter because they're the standard for what good looks like. So people live up to it by engaging in the behaviors associated with it. So they can be seen as like fitting the prototype. Um, leaders kind of engage in those behaviors to be seen as more leader-like. And so this creates whole workplace cultures that really represent Don and work for people who look like Don. So the more ways you fit the Don Draper prototype, the easier it is for you to advance, right? Because you automatically fit the standard for what good looks like. The more ways you differ from that though, the harder it is for you to advance. Um, so that's why in organizations when they're not really sort of meritocracies, right? It's not, it's not a level playing field and it's easier for some based on how well they fit the prototype. And that's not to say that if you fit the prototype, you haven't had to work hard. Um, what we're saying is that, you know, people who don't fit the prototype also work hard. It's just that they have to work hard while navigating barriers to their advancement. Um, and the interesting thing about the prototypes of one of my main messages in the book is there's this assumption, which I had wrongly, that, you know, the prototype works for, for men. Um, but it doesn't. Uh, so studies show, you know, living up to those sort of traditional ideas of masculinity create a lot of barriers for men in terms of their fulfillment and their advancement at work, right? It's very, very challenging for men to live up to Don um, in terms of like having to kind of not engage in any behavior associated with femininity in terms of being more empathetic, more democratic or caring at work. You know, when men do that, when they display those behaviors, they're not only deviating from the standard of what good looks like in workplaces, but they're devi deviating from the ideals we hold for what men and masculinity 
uh, look like. And so for men, their whole identity around masculinity and their identity around being a successful employee or a successful leader is intrinsically tied to Don. So men are kind of handcuffed, right? They're really encouraged to engage in those behaviors. And that can be really isolating for men. You know, it's difficult, even though men may have all male networks, they're discouraged from sharing their fears or concerns or, um, you know, any of their sort of emotional, mental load, right? And so, um, Don is a very, very isolating character and it creates a lot of challenges um, for men in workplaces. So my book delves into kind of the six, what I see as barriers that men face because of gender inequality in organizations. And that's important because my message is to men as much as it is to women. Um, you know, I always start with men because I say, you know, these are six barriers. They're very tricky barriers. You know, even like navigating work and home life for men is very, very difficult. Um, and my book goes into that in more detail. but as hard as it is for men, it's that much harder for women because women have about 17 barriers. And those barriers are not the same for all women. Uh, you know, really looking at sort of how race plays a role in it, how physical or mental ability plays a role in it. So it's really important to be aware of what the barriers are for women, but then how that's compounded by difference, right? Because again, the more ways you differ from Don, the harder it is to advance. So let me give you a simple example as to how this plays out for women. So one of the challenges women encounter early on is something called the conformity bind. So what we find is to be seen as successful, you have to live up to Don, right? You engage in some of those behaviors to be seen as more Don Draper-like. And a lot of women know other women in leadership positions who do conform to that prototype, right? But for women, that comes at a cost. So yes, like engaging in some of those behaviors will make you be seen as more leader-like, more competent, possibly more confident, right? So being more assertive, speaking up, dominant, willing to go it alone, um, sort of a command and control style of leadership, that will help you fit the prototype of what good looks like. Um, but the problem for women is that is in direct conflict with the standards that society holds for what good looks like for women, which is being more feminine, more meek, more mild, more unassuming, right? And so for women, they face this trade-off between competence and likability. And likability is really important for promotions and advancement, right? And so it's not enough to just be competent. And so women face this real trade-off, right? And, and that's why women get all this conflicting advice, like be assertive and dominant, but smile and be likable. And so, you know, it's like the smiling crazy assassin. It's just an impossible, possible challenge for women. There's no right way to be a woman at work, right? Um, because these environments were never designed uh, with us in mind and never designed with the, the idea that people can engage in a wide range of behaviors, right? You don't have to all fit this prototype. Um, the challenge also, so that's the conformity bind, but the challenge also gets harder when you add in things like race. So it compounds it because you're now further away from Don again, right? Because you have your race and your gender in conflict with the standard of what good looks like in workplaces. So a great example of this is speaking up. So while it's difficult for women to assert themselves in workplaces and speak up because they define the standard for what good looks like for women in terms of that meek mild, it's much harder for black women who also face the racist um, gendered stereotype of the angry black woman. So how, you know, it's really impossible for them to, for black women to speak up and assert themselves in a way that doesn't trigger both gender stereotypes and, and also racist stereotypes. So it's really difficult to assert yourself um, as a black woman in corporations today. Because when you do that, you're just much more likely to be penalized because of this angry black woman stereotype. And so it's very, very hard um, to navigate that in just the right way. Um, so that's just one barrier. I mean, my book outlines 17 and it's really important to get to know the barriers because when you know what they are as a woman, you don't internalize it, right? And you also helps you. I mean, I take you throughout a woman's career. You see all 17, how they show up. That's really helpful because you can see what you might have, the challenges you might have encountered, what's likely to come up as you enter motherhood, as you lead, you know, like leading, it's assumed that once women lead, there's no barriers. Not true, there's a lot of barriers. So you need to get to know them because it helps you navigate them and it stops you from internalizing them, right? Which is what happens. Like we, 
within the first three years of working life, you know, women's confidence in their ability to advance to senior leadership positions drops by more than 60%. And the reason for that is, you know, women don't know what the barriers are. And so when they encounter them, like the conformity bind and having to live up to Don, but also live up to being feminine and they get told to smile, and not be so assertive and, but be assertive to be seen as confident, like a lot of conflicting messages. And you start to think it's me, it's not my workplace. And you know, something's wrong with me. Maybe I don't fit in. And so it's really important to know the barriers, arm yourself with awareness, and then you can use that awareness and understanding um, to really try and be allies to one another. You know, white women can be allies to women of color. So, you know, they can amplify their voices. They can call out these barriers or day-to-day -day sort of exclusionary behaviors or inequality moments or microaggressions. They can, um, you know, take action to remove some of these challenges and be a support to one another. And it's so important for white women to do that because what we want from men in organizations, which is to know the barriers and take steps to remove them, you know, we have to do that for women of color. We have to demonstrate what it is that we're asking men to demonstrate and live by that. So this book outlines how to do that. It outlines what the barriers are for men and women and importantly, what leaders can do to fix workplaces so that they work for everybody. And I'll just sort of close by saying, you know, this is so important when we look at the future world of work. Um, so not only what skill sets are required now, but the skill sets that are required in the future. You know, if you think about Don Draper, he came about in the 1950s. You know, this ideal standard was developed around Ford Motor Company and back in the day, you know, this is organizations were hardwired for this prototype. This was the ideal. And while it may or may not have served us back then when, you know, only men really worked and men were in positions of power, um, it does not work today and it will not serve us in the future. So, you know, soft skills like inclusion, you know, um, leadership that's more collaborative, that's really empathetic, you know, that's what's required today in our workplaces today to be effective. You need that diversity of thought, you need that innovation, creativity, that, you know, collaborative problem solving. Um, but we're going to need that in the future, right? We need it now with coronavirus. Um, you know, we have to engage in new forms of inclusion, new ways of working together. Um, but even more so in the future where we need innovation. We're going to be working with AI and robotics and nanotechnology and the Internet of Things and 3D printers, you know, all this technological disruption will require new ways of working and that requires different skill sets. And so men and women need the freedom to be themselves at work and to be valued for that. And that starts with creating work environments where people can bring their whole selves to work and where they know that it's a safe place to, you know, share their whole selves and knowing that, you know, their unique talents and abilities will be valued. And so that's what every employee needs. And so my book outlines how leaders can do that and what that looks like. And importantly, I just want to share that, you know, I did write this book with women in mind. And so I'll close by leaving you all with the very, very first page, my message to all women, which is, so this book is um, for any woman who feels like they're not good enough. I hope you read this book and realize just how truly exceptional you are. So thank you so much. Um, please log on to my website at michellepeking.com for more information or you can buy my book at any of the great retailers that are out there. And thank you for listening to me. And I'm sorry I couldn't be with all of you at South by Southwest this year, um, but hopefully next time. So thank you, everybody.